afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As we're about to begin the session, we ask uh, for your continued cooperation and wish you an enjoyable time. Um, please ensure that you are signing with your full name, first, then last name, for record purposes. Uh, you can right click on your name where there'll be an option to make any necessary changes. Lastly, we would like to inform you that this event is being recorded for storage and archives. Therefore, to ensure the integrity of our production, we are kindly asking for your audio and video functions to be turned off at this time. Thank you once again for joining us this afternoon and for your cooperation. It is now with great pleasure that I hand you over to our treasurer, Jessica Kisui. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to our specially invited guests and colleagues from the Mona and Cave Hill campuses. I am Jessica Kisun, treasurer and trustee of the Pathology Club of UE, and I will be the chairperson for this afternoon's event. I would like to thank you all for joining us for the 17th installment of SUPAMSI on chemical pathology. Here with us this afternoon, we have two speakers, Dr. Donovan McBrowder and Dr. Steve Morley. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, I am privileged to be introducing our first speaker this afternoon, Dr. Donovan McBrowder, who will be sharing his wealth of experience and passion for chemical pathology. Before we begin, I will give a, a brief background on Dr. McGrowder. Dr. Donovan McGrowder holds postgraduate degrees in clinical chemistry, clinical biochemistry from the University of the West Indies and University of Westminster, UK. He also completed training in clinical biochemistry with the Association for Clinical Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine, UK and also training in epidemiology at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, Netherlands. Dr. McGrowder is a fellow of the Institute of Biomedical Science, UK, and Royal Society for Public Health, UK. He is also a member of the Institute for Clinical Research, UK. His current research focuses on the clinical utility of serum and genetic biomarkers in the early detection of breast and prostate cancer recurrence. Dr. McGrowder is married to Ruth and the union has produced two children, Abriana and Amelia. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the distinguished and certainly very diligent Dr. Donovan McGrowder. Right. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'll just um, upload my slides. And then at the end of my presentation, I'll, I'll stop and ask some questions and then Dr. Morley after that. All right. Thank you. So I, I wish to thank the committee for this invitation. And just want to share the objectives for this session to provide students with an overview of the specialty, the pathway to get into the specialty in chemical pathology, and to provide a few case examples to showcase the scope of practice and benefits of choosing the specialty. So I will share one case, and then when Dr. Moore, Moore shares, then he will share other cases. So in terms of the overview of my presentation and look at the role of the chemical pathologists, training in chemical pathology from the Royal College of Pathology perspective, the doctor of medicine in chemical pathology at the Mona campus, the program structure and curriculum, as well as syllabus, evaluation of progress, teaching method, criteria for award of um, that should be degree, sorry, um, and a case presentation. So chemical pathology, also known as clinical biochemistry, involves the biochemical investigation of body fluids, particularly blood, from which um, after centrifugation, there is serum and plasma based on the vacuum in a tube in which the sample is collected 
as well as urine and also cerebral spinal fluid, particularly um, CSF glucose and CSF protein. So those are the two main tests with respect to cerebral spinal fluid. It brings together science and medicine and also involves an understanding and knowledge of the chemistry of body fluids. And by monitoring information um, garnered from these tests, they are quite useful in diagnosing disease and recommend of us, our chemical pathology test results are very important in that respect. So a chemical pathologist is a medical consultant who works along with clinical scientists and medical technologists to provide a clinical biochemistry service in hospitals. So the chemical pathologist is responsible for the appropriate use of investigations, also interpretation of results, and of course, the growth and development of the chemical pathology service. It, the, also in terms of the role of the chemical pathologist may involve direct patient care and example in running lipid and diabetic and endocrine and bone disease clinics, particularly in the UK, in our setting is mostly um, endocrine clinic, the chemical pathologist is involved in. So in terms of training in chemical pathology, based on the Royal College of Pathology, then there is the medically qualified doctors who need to complete specialty training in chemical pathology and later specialized in metabolic medicine. Well, they, they are the clinical scientists that complete the higher specialty specific training program in chemical pathology and in order to become a consultant clinical scientist. How long in terms of the Royal College of Pathology training? It takes about five years to become a consultant chemical pathologist. So looking at the Royal College of Pathology training, there are four stages of training for chemical pathology, particularly A, B, C, and D. In stages A and B, training are introduced to the basic principles of chemical pathology and experiences gained in a hospital chemical pathology laboratory. They're also gaining um, clinical um, expertise, particularly in monitoring patients in an outpatient department. At stage C, the curriculum focuses more on the trainees' ability to practice chemical pathology at the consultant level. And by the end of this stage, the trainee would have completed the Royal College of Pathologists exams and be able to manage patients in areas such as diabetes, metabolic bone disease, lipids, nutrition, thyroid and renal disease, as well as inborn errors of metabolism. In stage D, the trainee work even more independently and they're given opportunities to lead projects and being able to provide clinical leadership for a chemical pathology laboratory, particularly in a hospital setting. They should also be able to manage patients with minimal supervision. And they could focus on areas of interest, particularly in research or those hostel that um, has um, a teaching base. So if I move locally in terms of Caribbean, the Department of Pathology, Faculty of Medicine at the Mona campus offers a doctor of medicine degree in chemical pathology. Applicants will be eligible, or they're eligible for entry after completing, completing sorry, the internship and senior house officer rotations. And then there's a specialty board which looks at these um, candidates. So the specialty board um, gives um, approval and the ratification is with the faculty of medical science this committee for graduate studies. In most cases, these candidates are required to attend an interview. It's really, it, um, there are times when we have you know, two or more candidates and they are interviewed by the um, lecturers, chemical pathologists in the department, and then a selection is made. And the date of entry is usually in July of each year. 
So if I look at the aim of the DM in chemical pathology, uh, the MONA campus is to produce clinicians who are competent to practice at consultant level in the specialty of chemical pathologists. And also these persons have training in anatomical pathology and hematology. And they should be able to make, take personal responsibility for their own actions. And teamwork is critically important in the delivery of the laboratory medicine component of healthcare services. So if you just look at the objectives, and there are quite a few of the DMN chemical pathology program to be competent and able to utilize generic and communication skills essential for assessment and treatment of patients referred for an expert clinical biochemical opinion, to be able to advise on the interpretation of laboratory results particularly in diagnosis, treatment, and monitoring of patients, as well as liaise with clinical colleagues in other specialties in medicine, et cetera, to develop critical skills in research and development, and be able to employ expertise and knowledge in independent and team-directed problem solving, as well as clinical assessment of published literature, to be knowledgeable of the lines of responsibility pertaining to clinical standards, guidelines, and evidence practice, and to fully participate in clinical audits as well as clinical assurance programs. So the chemical pathology is very critical in terms of clin clinical audits in the laboratory and assurance program, quality assurance programs. They develop skills to independently and effectively manage a chemical pathology service in an institution or hospital. So in hospitals, particularly as a, um, in pathology, there is usually a chemical pathology laboratory, like in our setting. So, so the chemical pathologist manages the laboratory in terms of the day-to-day. -day. And there are some chemical pathologists who actually works in a private setting in private laboratories. To acquire analytical skills for the range of techniques and instrumentation and the applications in producing results of clinical significance. So the Chemical pathologists at least need to have a good idea of the main or major an, um, analyzers that are in the laboratory, how it works, or the functions, or the methodologies, and it needs to be able to um, run that instrument in terms of carrying out tests on that instrument. And this is a picture of the COBA 6000 in the chemical pathology laboratory. Um, from Roche Diagnostics. It has a chemistry side and an E side. And it's pretty good in terms of um, the number of tests it, it does. The turnaround time for most tests, like, for example, UNEs, is within 30 to 40, mi um, to 40 minutes. So quite good. For um, immunoassay tests, test, sorry, particularly for hormones, et cetera, it may be about maybe 45 to 60 minutes, um, but um, quite good for our size, uh, size laboratory. But also in terms of the objectives to demonstrate good relationships with clinical, scientific, and clerical colleagues in the workplace and have appropriate communication as well as leadership skills to function as team leader if so requested. To possess the knowledge, the skills, and attitude to act at all times in a professional manner and being responsible for their standard of professional practice. And then the last two objectives to be familiar with health and safety regulations re relating to the practice of chemical pathology and by extension pathology and demonstrate adherence to safety laboratory practices and ethical conduct of self. And so the aim of the um, program really is to produce graduates who are committed to continuous professional and self development. So it's really to produce a graduate that is all around, particularly with emphasis in training and competence and skills, particularly in chemical pathology. So if I should just look at the program structure and curriculum, it's the DM, Doctor of Medicine in Chemical Pathology, is a four-year graduate course, which aims to produce graduates with the requisite knowledge and skills to function as a consultant in chemical pathology, particularly in a hospital-based setting, or in a private setting in terms of a, um, a clinical laboratory. So the program will be a minimum of 
four years from date of entry. And it's normally, in terms of the course of study, takes place at the University Hospital of the West Indies or at an institution in the contributing territories recognized by the university for this purpose. So the trainee is a student, a resident at the University of the West Indies. But in terms of um, practice, the treaty is um, employed to the University Hostel of the West Indies. And that's where, in terms of the training takes um, place in terms of day-to-day -day practice, whether in clinics, et cetera. And the laboratory, though belonging to the University of the West Indies, is actually located on the University Hostel of the West Indies um, compound. So each student is our trainee or resident is assigned to an academic supervisor who is a member of the specialty board in pathology. So there's a specialty board which looks at or monitors the academic progress of that student, as well as other students in subspecialties such as anatomical pathology and hematology. And so, so the supervisor's role is to provide academic guidance as to the choice or assignment of rotation the elective period and direction in the conduct of their research and all other relevant matters. So in a sense, supervisor guide the students in terms of other rotations, because at particular points or times, the resident is rotated in anatomical pathology and hematology, and also there is an elective um, period that the trainee or resident has to undertake. The program structure in terms of syllabus is quite wide, quite in depth to be covered in, in this four year period. So there is analytical clinical chemistry, which is more in the laboratory, general laboratory procedures, instrumentations, and so on. So it's important that the chemical pathology or the, the, the trainee or the resident knows inside out regarding the main analyzers and the other minor ones, um, know the analytical methods, et cetera. In terms of clinical biochemistry, general and interpretive clinical biochemistry, in terms of organ system diseases, metabolic and genetic diseases, et cetera. So endocrinology, tumor markers, renal function, et cetera, that's all under general and interpretive clinical biochemistry in terms of being able to interpret these results on a day-to-day -day and to assist our clinical colleagues. And again, this is, a broader view of the COBUS 6000 um, with the C side and E side. And of course, the um, analyzer is connected to a laboratory information system. So once the samples are processed, the results um, go through the laboratory information system to the main um, computer system and the results are therefore um, available. And of course, important in terms of the chemical pathologist being involved in us in the validation and interpretation of the results. But the syllabus also involves management. So laboratory management, management is very important. Management of the laboratory, in terms of supervision of the staff, also management of laboratory data, processing and computing. In terms of the pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical aspect, the chemical pathologist is in charge of all of that as a team leader. But there's also clinical laboratory medicine, pathology and medicine in terms of training in hematology, anatomical pathology and clinical medicine. So overall, the program is divided into two parts. There's part one and part two. So part one, is the first part is a minimum of 92 weeks, really, looking at two years, um, excluding leave. So the trainee or the resident starts with chemical pathology, spends 46 weeks in, chemical, in the chemical pathology um, sub-department. And then after that, um, starting the second year of training, the residents starts either, let's say, analytical pathology, spends three months, then move on to hematology, oncology, another three months, and then comes back to chemical pathology um, for the remaining 20 weeks or so and prepare for the part one exam. 
part two, this is senior resident, um, which in, in a, another 92 weeks duration, excluding leave. And in this period, the, can, the resident continues the syllabus in terms of finishing all the other remaining aspect of it. There's a six month period um, where the resident spends in internal medicine at the University Hospital of the West Indies or at an institution approved by the specialty board. And they're also, in, a, in addition in, to elective, maybe periods of observership at um, universities or hospitals um, locally or overseas. So there's continuous assessment of the resident's performance carried out by um, his or her supervisor. And this is recorded every six months. Part of it is the student, particularly as a senior resident, is asked to complete a research project, being guided by his or her um, supervisor. And of course, the Usually, the resident is um, supervised, and this project should be completed and submitted six, six months before the final part two examination. So, in terms of teaching methods, a range of teaching methods, in, including ward rounds and attending and being a part of the endocrine clinic, didactic and clinical teaching, over, over observership at training, um, overseas training sites as well as local training sites, and um, particularly also at local private laboratories. Particularly if there are instruments that we think are critical, which are present on site, like um, a mass spectro spectrometer, um, then you may want to send um, that the, the student to the particular institution, et cetera, that has a mass spec for training in a particular area. Attendance to courses in, in both hematology and anatomical pathology. So there are these courses that the resident has to complete because which somewhat prepares the student when they do the rotation in hematology and anatomical pathology, learning through teaching. So particularly the senior resident um, is allowed to conduct tutorials to the undergraduate students um, when they're rotating in the pathology clerkship, case presentation, Webinar, webinars, sorry, and also present their findings, particularly from the research at local, regional, and international conferences, as well as the involvement in audit and research projects. There's also a journal club. We have a postgraduate seminar every Tuesday morning, so the resident is um, scheduled to present once per, um, per quarter or once per semester engage in research activities and also publish findings in peer-reviewed journals. So in, if the resident particularly has um, some wishes in the future to be a lecturer, then he or she may, be, may engage or is encouraged to engage in research and to publish so that when the time comes, you know, he or she, in terms of um, being considered for a lecturing position, then there'll be some amount of publication, independent self-directed learning and maintenance of personal portfolio. And of course, there is the examination, which consists comprised of two parts, part one and part two. And generally, the exams are held in May, June, or um, to some extent in November or December. So in terms of the criteria for award of degree, so having the students satisfactory, um, complete all rotations, also completion of research project and satisfactory performance in both part one and part two examinations, he or she is awarded the doctor of medicine in chemical pathology. So just wanna go into the case um, at hand. So the chemical pathology laboratory offers a wide range of tests. Of course, there are the UNEs, um, thyroid function test, um, or hormones, tumor markers, wide range. And of course, not just for um, blood, but there's also for urine and CSF. So this is a case of a 16-year-old female presented with a slow enlarging penis mass in her 
front neck. And this mass had gone over a three year period. And it was initially excised, but uh, and was symmetrical in both sides of the neck and getting bigger over time. And it said that she complained of lack of concentration and attentiveness. She also easily um, got fatigue, but no complaints of palpitation. She was still able to do her normal activities, such as going to school and other social activity in her neighborhood. But she tend to um, get tired, um, particularly when she did excessive exercise. Her blood pressure is shown as being normal. Nexothalmus was found, and her thyroid gland was palp palpable, um, not tender, warm, and moist. There was no lymph node enlargement that was found. Her weight was 44 kilogram, height 158 cm, and body mass index 17.8. So I just put up this slide to show the chemical pathology requisition form that we use, particularly, of course, the UNEs, um, glucose, as in, in the first column, glucose fast into a postprandial. The protein profile comes next. Lipid profile, cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, LDL, cortisol, AM and PM. And then the middle column has the liver function test. Also included in that column is calcium, phosphorus, third function test. So the third function panel that we offer is TSH, free T4, free T3. But just note that in some laboratories, like private laboratories, they do offer total T4 and total T3. In the third column, the CSF glucose, CSF protein, and of course, the urine tests such as sodium and potassium and ure urea and creatinine proteins, et cetera. And there's VMA as well as sending ketogenic steroids and keto steroids. And the reference ranges are shown on, for each particular um, analyte. So the clinician, of course, requested thyroid function tests, particularly TSH, pre T4, and pre T3. And if we look carefully, we would have recognized that there is decrease in TSH as well as increase in free T4. The free T3 was somewhat low to low normal. Well, in a sense, it was in the normal range, but described as low normal to normal going into the middle range. So it's decreased TSH as shown, increased free T4 and low normal to normal um, free T3, right? So in the normal range, but regarded as um, low normal based on the reference of 2.27 to 4.47. So the TSH is regarded as a, a very sensitive test and it is usually low in patients with primary hyperthyroidism. Given the range, it is said that if we have a low value of less than 0 0.01, that's diagnostic for hyperthyroidism, while a value between 0 0.01 to 0 0.1 suggests hyperthyroidism. Of course, the exceptions include conditions that primarily affects the hypothalamus or the pituitary gland. So I think in keeping with that, it's clear that the patient had primary hyperthyroidism. Of course, increase in free T4, which suppressed, of course, the release of TSH from the pituitary gland. So it's an as example of um, primary hyperthyroidism. But there are also some other immunological, some tests such as immunological tests that support diagnosis in terms of, and this is more for microbiology, such as a thyroid peroxidase antibody that was, was elevated or regarded as positive. And the thyroid, thyroid globulin antibody, which was also elevated. In, so these are tests which are done locally in our context. There's also the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, which is the um, antibody against the taste receptor test, um, which is usually elevated in patients with grave disease. And so the sample is usually sent overseas to Quest Diagnostics. And the, of course, the patient has to pay. Um, there's also a hand in fee. And then the result comes back um, to the clinician and appropriate intervention is done. 
And based on the results, as well as ultrasound, that ultrasound that was done, it revealed that the patient has Graves' disease. It's a very unusual case, in essence, because you do usually find Graves' disease in adults, 30 to 40 years old, um, in terms of prevalence. And just thinking through the antibody test, um, the thiosinate immunoglobulin, the test which is done in our context overseas, is usually found in 80 to 90 percent of patients with Graves' disease. Uh, in 80% of patients with Graves' disease, you'll find the antiparaglobulin peroxidase, also known as the antimicrosomal antibodies, while 25% of patients with Graves' disease has high titles, particularly of antiparaglobulin antibodies. So the one that is very specific to, to Graves' disease is a thyroid simulated immunoglobulin, but it's not done locally, so the sample has to be sent overseas for testing. So, Peak incidence for grave disease, based on this slide, is usually age 30 to 50 years. It's the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. And the laboratory is very important, um, plays a very critical role in um, the diagnosis and also monitoring treatment of these patients. Particularly, I know routinely in our laboratory, we offer pre-T4 and TSH, and most laboratories worldwide, that's the basic routine test. Um, in our context, pre-T3 is regarded as a specialized test. Um, we, based on you know, funding constraints, we do ask the patients to pay for it. But in, a, in settings where the patient is unable to pay, and having done the free t 4 and TSH, and the counselor recognized that you know, it's important to do a free t 3 that's usually done and that assists the diagnostic process. So this is a picture of the chemical pathology laboratory, particularly at the at specimen reception. So the samples come in, usually the clinician um, complete this the yellow form as shown, and then they're entered into the, the laboratory information system by the medical technologists. And of course, um, there's a barcode system. These are the samples shown here, the centrifuge, and then the secondary small tubes with the serum or plasma is put on the COBUS, um, COBUS 6000. And then of course, the analysis takes place. And this is another sample, not another picture, sorry, at the, what we call the centrifuge area, where once the samples are spun, the serum is decanted in a secondary tube, and then of course, is then loaded onto the analyzer. All right, so that's my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you, thank Dr. You, Dr. McGrath for a very informative presentation. Certainly a lot of points were covered. Um, if it's okay with you, I think we can move to the second presentation and then have a general question and answer segment so that persons can ask questions that weren't already answered. Would that be okay? That's okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so now we move to our next speaker, Dr. Steve Morley, and I will do the same as before. I will give a brief intro. So Dr. Steve Morley trained at King's College Hospital, London, qualifying in 1993. After a medical rotation, he specialized in clinical biochemistry and then trained as an analytical and clinical forensic toxicologist. He has experience in over 40,000 post-mortem toxicology cases and 200 anti-mortem and post-mortem cr criminal toxicology cases. He is the previous chair of the London Toxicology Group is the present chair of the United Kingdom Clinical Toxicology Network, a senior examiner for the Royal College of Pathologists UK, a toxicology advisor for the Motorsports UK, and he also sits on the UK government panel for drugs and driving. He has over 50 publications and 17 meeting abstracts. His group for the first described Levmisol in cocaine in the UK, and more recently was the first to describe the synthetic cannabinoid and designer benzodiazepine trends in the UK. He has co-authored national guidelines for clinical, forensic, 
and postmortem toxicology investigations. He is a visiting lecturer for the master's course in analytical toxicology at King's College London and a visiting lecturer on the forensic master's course in Jamaica. He has lectured internationally, including Europe, USA, Asia, and the Caribbean. He has been involved in cases suspected of excited delirium, supporting both the deceased and police forces with the toxicology aspects of these cases. An inspiration to many, we are privileged to have him here with us this afternoon. And so ladies and gentlemen, I ask to please join me in giving Dr. Morley a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies, I was just um, somewhat shocked at how Dr. Walker's managed to find such a large kind of uh, biography of me. Um, just a, a slightly facetious point, um, excited delirium probably no longer exists. So Dr. Walker is probably having a heart attack in the background somewhere uh, with regard to that definition. Um, so yeah, as, as um, has just been explained, I spend most of my time now doing toxicology, but I also do uh, routine clinical biochemistry um, and do what I call duty biochemist on a weekly basis. What I've done is just picked out three cases uh, that I've dealt with over the last year or so. Um, I've stolen a couple of photos because the photos on the internet were better than the ones I had. Um, but if I just go through those and just give some examples of the sorts of things that I see both as a clinical biochemist and as a toxicologist. Whoops. Okay, so the first one, this is a 19 year old chap presented with a full day history of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting and fever. So that's not unusual for a 19 year old. Um, he had a high temperature, uh, was dehydrated and tachycardic, so fast heart rate and looked dry. Um, blood pressure was low at 110 over 40 when he was laying down uh, and basically almost undetectable at 88 over 36 when he stood up. Um, it was first thought this might be due to the infection, uh, due to being tachycardic, um, due to his high uh, temperature. Um, but basically, he was describing what, what was described as basically abdominal pain all around his, uh, all around his tummy. Um, I was, I, I do acute medical on calls as well. Um, I was seeing this patient, um, and there were several interesting things that are probably difficult to see on here, but he's got hyperpigmentation. So he's got dark skin um, on his hands and on the dorsums of his feet. He's got hyperpigmentation in his mouth as well, and he's got a hyperpigmented uh, tongue. Uh, this chap was, in fact, Afro-Caribbean as well. Um, and as all the students on here today will know, um, dermatological diagnosis in the Afro-Caribbean is extremely poorly done by us white Caucasians. Um, because the skin colour is not as good as it should be. Um, so we have to be careful with that. To me, that's a spot diagnosis in somebody who is presenting with hypotension and um, hyperpigmentation. So what we did, we did some laboratory tests and he had a sodium concentration of 116 millimoles per liter, which is very low. Potassium was high normal, uh, but then we measured his cortisol levels um, at 63.4, with the normal being 172 to 496. Uh, and we measured his ACTH and that was high at 440. So if I just go back a slide, um, this is a classical case of um, adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease, where he's essentially producing no adrenal hormones and therefore can't maintain his blood pressure. And he's got secondary feedback from his hypothalamus given a raised ACTH. This is where as a chemical pathologist, um, I was able to make a diagnosis using the clinical signs and symptoms that I saw, along with the biochemical tests that are done in my laboratory. My advantage is I have more of the laboratory-based uh, expertise. Any endocrinologist could have made this diagnosis. Any acute physician should be making this diagnosis. Uh, but the advantage of doing chemical pathology is often you end up seeing the slightly more unusual cases uh, on a more regular basis. So uh, I did general medicine uh, as my training for a start. Um, I love little old ladies who have lots of comorbidity, uh, but actually treating those is extremely difficult and actually making them better 
uh, is often a difficult thing to do. So I enjoy chemical pathology because I can make instant diagnosis or almost instant diagnosis and often provide an appropriate treatment and that allows a patient to become better. Um, that, to some people, is far more interesting than the very useful and very helpful parts that we do for other people within general medicine, where, in fact, a lot of the time you're, you're treating chronic disease rather than treating acute, acute disease. Um, it's just something I enjoy on the chemical pathology side of things. Case two, uh, I'm a toxicologist, so I had to get a toxicology case in here somewhere. Uh, this was a young chap who was a heroin user. Uh, in the United Kingdom, we have what we call abstinence clinics. So essentially, people come along, they are given methadone um, on the understanding that they will no longer take heroin and they will use methadone instead as a maintenance treatment. And then the plan is to get these people slowly off methadone and eventually get them off any sort of drug treatment at all. Um, he was treated with methadone, seen a week after he'd, um, he'd started the methadone. Uh, and claimed he was using his methadone as prescribed. Um, we did a urine screen. It was opiates positive. Now, in a general um, situation, opiates can be morphine, heroin, folcadine, codeine. So any of the opiate drugs can cause a positive opiate result. We saw methadone, which is good news. Uh, he was supposed to be taking methadone. But what we didn't see was the methadone breakdown product. And we also looked for cannabis and, and cocaine, and neither of those were there either. So what that tells me is that this chap has something in his urine, which gives you a positive methadone result, but he has no evidence that he's metabolized any methadone through his body because he's got no metabolite present in his urine. So what I asked to do was see the urine sample. Um, on the right is a normal patient sample. The one on the left, so A, is a sample he allegedly produced. Um, I'm sure even for those who are not fully quite doc fully quite qualified doctors yet will realize that the, the green sample is highly abnormal. Um, people almost never produce green urine unless you eat a lot of asparagus in the United Kingdom. But in general terms, a green urine is not a normal urine. What you may or may not be aware of, in the United Kingdom, at least, we use methadone in a liquid form, uh, and it's a bright green colour. So what this chap had done, um, he had almost certainly sold the methadone that he'd been given in the clinic, bought himself some heroin, uh, and to try and get around the urine test, he'd put methadone into his own urine. The trouble with that, of course, is we were able to tell immediately, A, because of the biochemical test we did, but again, being good clinicians, and that's basically the basis of chemical pathology, looking at the clinical results you have. He had green urine, which immediately told me he'd spiked his urine with methadone uh, rather than actually taking his methadone himself. So that's basically what I do as a toxicologist, uh, or part of what I do as a toxicologist is, is support drug control clinics as well. And just finally, a, a relatively standard sample that we see, which again is useful um, to have a chemical pathologist involvement. 65-year-old chap, intractable vomiting, tired, palpitations, polyuria, so peeing a lot, and constipation. Um, those, you know, if you know the diagnosis, are classical of probably hypercalcemia, but of course, in a 65-year-old chap, those could be non-specific symptoms of many, many different um, disease processes. But we did, we measured his calcium, we measured his albumin, which was low but normal. We measured his phosphate, which again was relatively normal. So as a chemical pathologist, I know that almost all hypercalcemia is either due to cancer or due to PTH excess. So what we do then, after we see a high calcium, we will simply measure a PTH. In this particular case, the PTH was highly suppressed, which suggests to me is it is not PTH excess. And therefore, unfortunately, this chap probably had cancer. We went on the day further investigations, and in fact, he had prostate cancer and had bone metastases, which was causing his hypercalcemia. Um, so just, yeah, I'd never come across this mnemonic before, but it, yeah, when you are a medical student, when you're on the wards, when hopefully some of you become chemical pathologists, 
the causes of hypercalcemia can be described as chimpanzees, um, just a useful one to remember. Uh, and on that, I'll stop. Uh, and along with Dr. McCrowder, we'll take any questions about anything we've discussed, any questions you have about getting into chemical pathology or any other general queries you have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Morley, for a very enlightening and educational presentation. At this time, the floor is open for any questions that the audience may have. If you'd like to ask a question, you can turn on your mic and ask, or you can simply place the question in the chat. If using your mic, please remember to turn it off after you've asked your question. So guys, don't be shy. If you have anything that you would like clarified, now is the time. Okay, while we're waiting for the participants to think of questions, I have a few that came in before the start of the session. So anyone can answer. They, um, one student would like to know what a typical day in the life of Dr. Morley looks like versus a typical day in the life of Dr. McGrowder as chemical pathologist. So I'm, I'm slightly odd um, in that, as I said, I spend most of my time doing toxicology. Um, my, my chemical pathology colleagues will probably on a typical day, um, well, in a week, they will do possibly two or three um, medical clinics. So usually lipids, bone, um, metabolic disease. Um, then they will spend a day doing laboratory management. Um, we will spend a lot of our time doing clinical liaison. So I will talk to general practitioners, hospital doctors. I will go out on the wards and look at patients as I said, who've got abnormal biochemistry. Um, about one day of the week I spend doing research. So we've got research both in toxicology, but also in clinical biochemistry as well. Um, so uh, what, what I love about my job essentially is it is so varied in that I get to do, as Dr. McCrowder said, clinical work, research, little bit of management. Um, so it's, it's possibly only one of the few general medical jobs left where you're doing true general medicine. So if you do gastroenterology, um, you will spend all your time putting pipes up people's bottoms. Uh, in chemical pathology, I don't do that. Um, I get to see the patients. I get to see a patient who's got cancer one moment. I get a patient who's got thyroid disease the next. I get a patient who's got diabetes the next. Um, I get to see my, my um, I go to coroner's courts with regard to postmortem work as well. Um, so that's essentially what I do as a, a medical chemical pathologist. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mavrella? Yeah, hi, hi, Dr. Morley. Yeah, so my role is more um, more lab laboratory based. So it's to manage the lab on a day to day basis in terms of laboratory management, in terms of ensuring that all the tests are done, um, validation of the results, training the students, doing research. And sometimes we partner with our clinical colleagues in terms of hematology to uh, give them some support and possibly a few um, rounds, um, clinical rounds. In that respect, yeah. Okay, can, sorry, can I just ask the question? So, so you're medically, because yeah, as some of the students may know, you're scientifically trained. Trained, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so your 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 chemical pathologist will do lipid clinics, bone lipid clinics as well. Yeah. Yeah. Clinic, et etc. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you both for the answers to the question. The second question that came in is. Can you tell us some changes that you would have experienced over the years, such as technological advancements and how you were able to overcome these changes? Do you want to go first, other one? Yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I guess the, the big thing that we're seeing in the United Kingdom is we're, we're seeing changes in, in the analysis we do. So Dr. McGrath mentioned something called mass spectrometry. Um, we, we are fortunate in the UK that we have quite a lot of mass spectrometry. What that allows us to do is look at things like um, endocrinology with more accuracy and we don't see as many interferences. The trouble with that is a mass spectrometer costs possibly um, half a million pounds sterling. Um, so they are extremely expensive pieces of kit. I think the, the other thing we've seen is we're seeing a lot more preventative medicine nowadays as well. So when I started, um, that was before statins were regularly used for cardiovascular disease. Now it is almost impossible to not be on a statin 
and have a good cardiovascular disease profile done on you at a you know, young to middle age. So I think we've moved a lot from pure diagnosis to preventative medicine. And I think the other thing we're moving to now is what we call precision medicine, which again is where chemical pathology is very much at the forefront. So we are looking at uh, both you know, epidemiology, we're looking at people's demographics, we're looking at males versus females, we're looking at the genetics as to actually, if you give, for example, a particular drug, uh, antibiotics, some people do really well on them, some people do really badly. And one of the reasons for that is because of your own personalized both physiological makeup, but also genetic makeup as well. And I think that's where you know, the more exciting things are going to be over the next five to 10 years as well with regard to chemical pathology. Yes. Dr. McGrath, yeah. Yes, I think for us, there are um, financial constraints. Um, so in order to do tests, for example, moving on into precision medicine, that requires some sort of funding. But I think from a laboratory perspective, we have seen the changes in instrumentation. So where we normally use benchtop machines, you have really moving into these huge analyzers that can do a wider variety of, of tests and um, also incorporation of new tests um, such as D-dimers, um, tumor markers like CA99, those tests which improve diagnosis and also monitoring. So it's changes in the laboratory perspective. Um, I think in terms of precision medicine, um, at some point we'll move in that direction as we get more funding to do tests which are more, you know, individualized patient care. But it's really, from a laboratory perspective, a change in terms of instrumentation, being able to provide um, tests in a, in, a, in, a, in a faster time, reducing the turnaround time, et cetera, and also tending to move towards even some proteolytophoresis in terms of instruments, densitometry, that are able to give more precise results to the clinicians. Okay, thank you. Certainly very good answers. So the last question that came in was, do you have any advice for students aspiring to pursue chemical pathology? Uh, I think my first advice was be, make sure you do some general medicine beforehand. And certainly in the United Kingdom, you now have to have MRCP before you can enter the chemical pathology training. Um, I think you know, it's my own view that you know, medics nowadays specialize far too early. Uh, and I think what we should be doing is getting a broad foundation in general medicine um, before we actually specialize. Now, the fortune, the, you know, the, the advantage of doing it in, in the Caribbean is you still do hematology, you do pathology as part of your rotations. That no longer happens in the United Kingdom. So when people enter ChemPath, they only do ChemPath. Um, Again, I, I was fortunate I did five years in general medicine before I moved into ChemPath. Uh, but my advice is get a broad education first. Um, Dr. Walker wants to come in here. Alfredo, do you want to have a quick word? I knew you couldn't keep quiet. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. No, I didn't. I wasn't interrupting you. I was you. waiting my turn. Good afternoon, um, Dr. Magrado, and good afternoon, Dr. Morley. Um, I just uh, wanted to make one comment and ask one question. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Malgrauda uh, for his uh, very detailed presentation. And I think it's the first time we interact in one-on-one, uh, -on -one, so it's a pleasure to meet you. And secondly, to Dr. Morley, I, I know that the Royal College has recently uh, introduced a new initiative. It has sort of relaxed uh, the requirement for international medical graduates to pursue training uh, in the UK. So for those uh, medical students who uh, would be thinking of going the route of UK training, if you can just, um, you know, provide a brief summary of the new initiative where I think the Royal College could actually apply um, to the GMC to sponsor them in terms of getting their their license. Thanks. Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do that. Sorry, Dr. McGrath, do you want to do your bit first on that? Uh... No, yeah, well, um, in terms of students, um, I think um, there is the clerkship um, that the fourth year medical student does. So they do in the pathology microbiology clerkship, they do a rotation in microbiology in anatomical pathology, hematology, and, chem and chemical pathology. So it's, 
really paying attention to those, you know, foundation principles from first to second year and ensure that they do well um, in the classroom. And I think that will be the foundation for when they become a resident in chemical pathology. Yeah, so basically, as Alfredo has just said, um, there is a big move at the moment to support international graduates uh, who wish to do some training or all their training in chemical pathology, general pathology, um, immunology, hematology, or micro within the United Kingdom. Um, and what you have to do is you have to find yourself a sponsor hospital who are prepared to take you on and provide the training. Um, you will get essentially identical training, or you should get identical training to the UK graduates. Um, and what you can do then is you can then sit the FRC path exam if you wish, um, and you can get what we call a CESA or Certificate of Extended uh, Registration. Um, that gives you an equivalent to the UK um, training. Um, as Alfredo is aware, and as, as, as Dr. McGrath is aware, I'm, I'm, I'm a great fan of ensuring that the Caribbean keeps its own good staff as well. Um, I'm the external examiner, for certainly for Kempath. Um, and I would suggest that the, the Kempath offered at uh, UWE is it's very close to equivalent to what we offer in the United Kingdom. Now, as Donovan said, there are a few things that you know, matter but don't matter, such as mass spectrometry. Now, you don't have to be good at mass spectrometry to be a good chemical pathologist. Um, it is a technique you can learn, but as a chemical pathologist, you won't be running the machines. You will be taking the laboratory information and using that in a clinical perspective to support the patients. And Dr. McGrowder may well become an expert in mass spectrometry or his, his kind of technical staff, um, but not having it in the in the Caribbean is not a detriment to training for chemical pathology. Um, and the experience you get in, in the Caribbean, I would say, is almost equivalent to that you get in the United Kingdom. Of course, we are very keen and we, we would love to have all the very good students coming to the United Kingdom to support us in the United Kingdom. But I'd also support everybody staying in the Caribbean uh, to offer a very good service to your public in the, in the Caribbean as well. I've signed this Dr. McGrath. I can't hear anybody. Has everybody gone quiet? Okay, thank you everyone for all of the answers. Thank you, Dr. Walker, for your question. Um, if there are no further questions, I would like to, um, there's a feedback link that has been sent in the chat. It's a mentee feedback so that Dr. Morley and Dr. McGrowder can receive some real-time feedback on their presentations from the audience. So you click on the link, enter the code, and then you continue with the instructions from there. So I'll just give everyone a few more seconds to finish that off. I'm not sure I want to see this, but anyway, we'll see what comes up. Okay, so Dr. Morley and Dr. McGrowder, certainly our audience found both presentations very informative, very informative, enlightening, inspiring, well-organized, good session, entertaining, awesome, insightful. So really great feedback, all great words to describe what we heard this afternoon. Um, do you have any final words before I close and give the vote of thanks? I hope we see some of you in chemical pathology in the next five years, I guess, yes. Yeah, and, 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 and thank you for inviting us, I mean, to, to share with you and, and hope that we'll find more. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. So I hope everyone had a wonderful learning experience this afternoon. At this time, a feedback form has been sent in the chat. Please take a minute to fill it out. It will be greatly appreciated, not only for documentation purposes, but also for the improvement of future events. So I'll give everyone one minute to complete it.
Okay, so while that's being completed, I have a quote that Dr. Seuss once said, you have brains in your head, feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself in any direction you choose. Firstly, I'd like to thank our featured speakers, Dr. Steve Morley and Dr. Donovan McRowder, who both, despite their busy schedules, graced us this afternoon with very educational presentations where we all learned about chemical pathology. I would also like to extend sincere gratitude to Dr. Alfredo Walker, one of our advisory board members for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate your endless support and thank you for playing a key role in supporting us throughout our journey thus far. We thank you for taking your valuable time, effort and consideration in the investment to nurture and properly establish the future of pathology. It is not only an act of success, but one of greatness, showing us the path that you have walked on. Last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for accompanying us this afternoon and making our event a success. We look forward to your continued support. To all of our UE students and staff across the three campuses at the University of Ottawa and Eastern Ontario Laboratory Regional Association, and especially to our specially invited guests, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this marks the end of our session this afternoon. Thank you once again for joining us for our 17th installment of CPAMC, and we do hope to see you at our future events. Do enjoy the remainder of your afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Come on,